All right, guys. So bear with me. A lot of these I cannot pronounce the name of. Um, so my cult's on Bhagwan Sri Rajneesh. I can't find the mouse. Oh, there. Okay. All right. Where did it start? India. So it was this guy. This guy. His name would formally um, later on be called Osho. So I'm just going to say Osho because I don't want to pronounce his long name. Um, so it started in India in about where this guy, uh, he was a philosopher. He taught at a university in India. And he started realizing that he didn't like some of Hindu Hinduism's beliefs, cultures, things like that. So he wanted to branch off from that. One of his biggest things was a spiritual awakening. Um, he believed in what's called say Sionism or Sayanism, where you denounce everything that uh, of the world and basically be a spiritual being without any indulgences or anything like that. Keep that in mind because we'll get back to that. And then he also, this was kind of turned into a social movement in India because a lot of people kind of wanted to sin away from the traditional Buddhism and Hinduism that was very prominent in India. So some of the core beliefs was the new man, which again is talking about that idea that you're the spiritual being, you're the spiritual um, thing that doesn't need certain like indulgences, um, and things like that. Spiritual without rejection was his biggest part. He wanted the indulgences. He wanted to modernize this idea. So one of his biggest things was sexual freedom. We'll get into a little bit about that. Maybe a little. Yeah. Um, and then dynamic meditation, which was this very creepy form of meditation that he would do. And at one point he would like touch them. They would go crazy. And then all of a sudden they would like stop and like just kind of fall to the ground. It was really weird to watch because I watched a documentary on this and I watched it happen and it was incredibly uncomfortable. Um, <laughs> so they wanted people who were tired of a mundane lifestyle. There were a lot of the personal antidotes that I'll talk to you about are people who were just stuck in their life. There was this woman named Jane Storks who we'll talk about later who is Australian. She hated her life. She was like, I'm bored of being a mom, of being like this. I need something else. And he really fueled that for a lot of people, um, which a lot of cults do. A lot of people that go into these different types of religious beliefs or cults like that often have a mundane lifestyle or they're just tired of their life. So neo sionism neo sayism can't say it right. I've been trying to pronounce it for a while, but I can't say it correctly. Um, they were basically, again, didn't want to indulge, wanted to be a spiritual being. I don't know why they joined this cult because they were still allowed to indulge in things and also be a spiritual being, but they were he very heavily attracted. And then they were able to get people through meditation, people that would be referred to psychologists um, that were a part of this movement would do the dynamic meditation that involved chaotic breathing, dancing, standing like that for like an hour, and then the whole touching the head, they go silent. And then also, yeah, go to my next slide. Okay, so characteristics of the cult, again, sexual freedom. They indulged a lot in that materialistic spirituality, which is they can just have everything but still be a spiritual being and be fine. Capitalism. This guy was really into capitalism. Um, he denounced socialism. He hated it. So I thought that was kind of funny. And then colors. They also just dressed up in orange and red. I don't, I don't know why. They... It was very much just like a thing on the documentary that that's what they did. They, uh, I don't know if I talk about this, we're gonna get into it a little bit. So they ended up going to Oregon, Antelope, Oregon. It was this very small town, middle of nowhere, Oregon. The population was like 40. They buy this $18,000 acres of land, start building a community, kind of like Jonestown, and basically end up committing bioterrorism because they wanted to win an election within the county of Dallas, Oregon. So they poisoned 751 people with salmonella. And yeah, we'll, we'll get into that more. Jane Stork is the mom I was talking about from Australia. She moved her entire family to India. Her entire family practiced, um, practiced this religion. And basically, she 
was caught up in with the immigration fraud that we'll talk about and the bioterrorist attack. So she fled to Germany and now she's on the Netflix documentary. She renounced the cult after fleeing, but it was she was very into it and she's one of the main people in the documentaries. And you can tell just kind of she was really looking for something and she had found it in this kind of cult and she stayed with it for a long time and was pretty high, high up into the cult. Philip Tolex, he was their attorney, which is their lawyer for the immigration fraud, the bioterrorist attacks, anything they wanted to do, he did it with them. He was also pretty high up. And then Sheila, who is the biggest person in all of this, she was the spokesperson for Osho because partway going into Oregon, he stopped talking. Like he, like that was his thing. He was just like, I'm not gonna talk anymore. So she was the spokesperson for everything. And she basically ran everything. She was like the kind of person underneath Osho that basically did everything. And she's also in the documentary. She would be heavily looked at into immigration fraud and the bioterrorist attack. She also fled to Germany and they found her in Switzerland for the documentary series. And you, she like narrates half of the documentary series. So it's kind of crazy. Um, but yeah, so they, the bioterrorist attack, which was the biggest one at the time in the entire United States, and it was the first ever reported one. And then the immigration fraud, that was also the biggest case of immigration fraud that the U.S. had had at the time. And then it's still alive. It's in India again. They're not in Oregon anymore, if you were wondering. Um, it's in India. They're still thriving. They have around 16,000 members now, and it's a very big practice religion that is in India. That's all I have. How did they commit the terror? What, what did they do? So they put, they had two county commissioners and they put salmonella into their drinks and then they poisoned like a couple restaurants around the town with salmonella and then that's how it got sent. So pretty bad, honestly. Really bad. Yeah. <laughs> I, and then I, they yeah. didn't even win the election, so it was kind of for nothing. Look at like salad bars and green. Yeah, it was it was like something where like you kind of would never guess, and then they figured out that it was them, and it was it's like, oh, that's awful. Pretty weird. Yeah. All right, good job. It's not me. 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 International. This is awful. Brace yourselves. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Ooh. Yeah, this one's pretty rough. So here. Yeah. Give me a sec. Yeah. That's quite disgusting. I have lots of information to talk about, too. So right. I'm just going to speed run everything. Go. This is David Brantberg. He's the founder of the Family International. Uh, he goes by King David, Mo, Moses David, Father David, Dad, and Grandpa. Um, he's not alive anymore, but he founded the Family International in 1968. He was raised in an evangelical Christian family. His mom was kicked out of the evangelical church because she started claiming that she was a healer and could perform Jesus-like miracles on people. And after they were kicked out of the church, they started traveling the country and going around and like healing people. And it was really, I mean, that was probably a lot of where his religious trauma comes from. But um, then he was expelled from his first pastoral organization, which is the Christian and Missionary Alliance. And he claims it was because he was supporting racial diversity. And it was actually because he was having an affair with the underage secretary. So it was, yeah, he, he was, but we'll get into kind of his belief claims next um and then he was also a teacher for a while but he quit teaching because evolution isn't real and he couldn't teach evolution theory because he didn't believe in it so he stopped teaching altogether and then in 1994 he died after 23 years of hiding from the law in portugal so their beliefs are kind of progressive but also like it's mostly based around assault which is really a lot of cults. But um, one of the things they talk about in um, a website of all, a lot of ex-members that got together that I looked at was they 
preached that male homosexuality was a sin, but lesbianism was not a sin. So again, lots of like really weird um, undertones to just about everything they do. They're kind of Christian, but also they totally aren't. They think that end times, like they they claim to believe in a true line God and a um, Trinity, but the Holy Spirit is feminine. But also that heaven is in the moon. It's a pyramid in the moon that you go to and live inside of the moon when you die. And the end times are coming when David Berg dies. The, the end is coming, the second coming of Jesus. And obviously that didn't happen because we are still here and he is not. Um, David Berg also had a lot of weird apocalyptic predictions like the Kohotek Comet destroying the world by bringing Jesus to planet Earth. He said California earthquakes would mark the start of the Great Tribulation in 18 or 1989, and then the second coming of Jesus would be in 1993, and then he would die. David Berg would die, and the world would end in 94, which he did die in 94, but then also Jesus didn't come to Earth and kill everyone. So that also, yeah. So this is where we get into the, like, really awful stuff. Um, from 68 until 77, they were known as the Children of God. They practiced flirty fishing, which is something they kind of developed. It was where young women who are a member of the church would essentially engage in prostitution to get men to join. And it worked. They got over 200,000 people to join the cult through flirty fishing. And over 300 children were born from this practice. And they call those children Jesus babies. And a lot of those people are still alive. Um, there was a New York Attorney General investigation in 1974 into this, and um, whether or not they deserved tax exempt status, and they decided they didn't. And then they also charged them for obstruction of justice and defiance of law because a lot of the members were just, you know, the prostitution was a big part of that. And then they were draft dodgers as well. A lot of them were trying to get out of the draft because he was preaching supposed progressive politics they didn't want war um and then flirty fishing was supposedly abandoned at the end of this time period in 77 because of fears of the aids epidemic but there's accounts of this practice still continuing which i'll get into in just a second um between 78 and 87 they rebranded as the family of love because of jonestown so they were like oh we really look like this organization and that's not good and we want people to join us and 900 people just died so let's rebrand and they did I, I mean that's really they called it the reorganization nationalization revolution where they fired basically every executive and then hired a bunch of them back but they only hired ones that were in support of flirty fishing so yeah they really just used it as a way to get rid of all of the people who weren't all in and it was horrible. They also, in this time period, started doing more door-to-door -door recruiting as a means to say, you know, we're not just using flirty fishing. We're getting all these people through door-to-door -door interactions, which, as you all know, work really well. Uh, so from 82 to 94, this is the worst part for sure. So they started moving to different countries across the world. They lived, there were um, 10,000 different members in 1,642 homes in across the world, South America and Africa mostly. Um, David Berg was on a radio show often and said that they would convert all these people and they were converting all these people. And, you know, he was releasing these numbers of if, if we continue this, this is how many people we're going to have next year. And the problem was his projections projected more people would join the church than existed. So he was like, yeah, there's going to be 20 billion people in our organization by the year 2020. Well, funny story. There's not 20 billion people. on So obviously he was trying to upsell this. So he, Berg sexually assaulted a lot of young women, um, both of his daughters his daughter-in-law and two of his granddaughters were among those victims. And then his wife, Karen Zerby, and their uh, assaulted their child. And it was a lot of it was printed, photographed and printed in a story, a book called The David Ito Story. It's just as bad as you think it is. It's horrible. They have like the better pages censored and like it doesn't show any of the pictures but it shows the words and it was very graphic and 
not something that you should look at. Um, and we'll get into some more Ricky Rodriguez stuff in a later slide, but the group has still not accepted responsibility for any of this, even though they've been charged with crimes in Argentina, Australia, Brazil, France, Italy, Japan, Norway, Peru, Spain, Sweden, United Kingdom, USA, Venezuela. All of those are for sexual abuse. They have court cases in every single one of those countries. Uh, the organization is still claiming to this day that they've been proven innocent in all of those cases. That's objectively not true. They've been ordered multiple times. The big one is they were ordered to pay a million dollars to a plaintiff who left the organization that still has not been paid. That was in the 70s that they were ordered to do that, and it still isn't. They still have not paid that. Um, also, after losing their tax exempt status in after the last time period in 94, they again kind of rebranded and created the Family Care Foundation, which is a scam charity. If you join the organization, you have to donate 14% of your income to the Family Care Foundation, and they use that money to grow as an organization, supposedly, but it's just embezzlement. Um, the love charter is what tells you that you have to give away 14% of your income. And this is kind of like their rules and regulations for living and existing in the family. But Karen Zerby, who is the wife of Berg, at this point he was, he, he had died. And so she was kind of taking over the organization and she was able to change the love charter at any time for any reason. So it was really just her saying whatever she wanted. So then from 04 to now, this is also pretty intense. Ricky Rodriguez, um, there was a murder-suicide incident where he killed his wife, I believe, and then himself, and he filmed it, and it was a 30-minute video. It, does, it doesn't exist anymore, but um, he talked about how all of this was to get vengeance on his father and his mother for the abuse, and then there were... Since 2004, obviously, there's ongoing court cases in all of those countries because of the massive amounts of abuse. Uh, and then the last slide, I went on to a computer. I made a fake email account, John Doe, just to see what they wanted. And this was definitely the most unsettling part. Uh, they do at the very end, once you've entered all of your email address, um, your name, your information, where you live, which obviously all of that was made up. Um, they do make you fill out how many children you have, how old they are, um, what their gender is, and that's very unsettling to me. I think it's yeah, just because of their past, but they still have not accepted responsibility for any of their massive crimes and yeah, pretty horrible organization, but you can definitely see like they're preaching a lot of the same things that uh, Jonestown was promising. Like we're progressive and we're it's justice and we're getting justice for people and anyone's welcome to join our organization. But then there's also lots of undertones of not progressive, um, like weird, perverted things. So yeah. That's the Family International. We're, uh, we're one of the more intimate, that's for sure. Yeah. All right, good job with that. Right. Yep, and yes. Hey. So, give me a sec. <laughs> Killinger's didn't come up. Oh, it didn't. <laughs> Are you sentenced? No, I can't ask. He's right here. <laughs> Dylan, you sent your. I got revoked. Hang on. Did you go back? Where's the smaller? Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm almost going to play. I'm going to play. There we go. We got it. All right. Why well, set this up? It's coming. It's coming. It's three months. Yeah. Okay. Do one sec. 
Uh, there's a paper up here. Yeah, grade it real quick. Oh, oh I, got, I can do it. Yeah, I got it. I think it was just for uh, third period, and I just forgot this. Okay. I think they weren't better. Uh, well, you can have it. <laughs> All right. Oh, well, yeah. Sleep. Bit of levity after the past two. Exactly. A lot less abuse in this one. All right. Classes. So. Obviously, you have to start with where Isis herself came from as a concept. So, the oldest recorded, like, the oldest recorded myth about the goddess Isis is found in a set of engravings called the Pyramid Texts, which were obviously found in the Pyramid, and they had back to the old kingdom of Egypt, which is, you like, around 500 BC. And basically how this, this myth is about the succession of kings in Egypt at the time, and just... How that's just sort of how that went. So it starts with uh, the death of the original king of the gods, who was called Osiris. By he was killed by his brother Set, and his body parts were scattered into the Nile. And then after that, so his wife Isis put it back together, and he became a god of the dead. And their son eventually became the new king of the gods. And over time, this myth would actually would spread to be one of the most common myths in will be the most common myth of Egyptian mythology. But so about Isis herself, she had a lot of different roles over time, just to partially due to the fact of how old she was and also just how many different like how widespread the idea of Isis was. So she was often depicted as a goddess of marriage and childbirth due her due to her role in the original myth. She's also a lot of later so one of the oldest like aspects of her myth was mainly worshipped was her relation to kingship. Her, a lot of the times in more ancient carving, she was depicted as having a throne on her head as sort of the crown. Kind of interesting. But over time, she gained aspects of like, sort of a goddess of wisdom, magic, woman book, just sort of, the bit, Isis sort of just grew over time and sort of expanded it and actually like took over some other gods and sort of took on their roles. Actually, really, for example, the horns came from a different god, about, uh, from a, a different goddess, just you know, name, but yeah, just a very highly adaptable concept, just due to like how vague the original story was about her. But so a lot of the, so a lot of the, after like she sort of, the concept of Isis sort of took over Egyptian mythology, the there's this guy named Alexander the Great, you may have heard of him, who came in and basically conquered the Middle East, Northern Egypt, all of those areas, and put them under Greek rule. And over that, he, during that, he founded this city called Alexandria, which, along with him making, and basically artificially making a new god for the Egyptian pantheon called Serapis, which doesn't really have any relevance to the story, but it introduced the concept of a mist of cultists and mystery religion to Egypt. So obviously we all know what a cult is now. Like, but something you may not be aware of is that cult actually has a really has a different definition in these times. And it was sort of this idea of cultivating a specific god or goddess so that they maintain their power or and the faith continues. And almost sort of I'd say a mono, a monotheistic way, sort of just a single minded devotion to this one deity. And just, there are a lot, one subset of the sort of cults, which are sort of the group of people who dedicate themselves to this god, were called mystery religions. And they basically, what a myth, and they were named after a specific form of, form of worship that they practice called a mystery, where the, you experience, basically experience the divine through a state of dis disorientation, either through usually a bright loud, a bright sound or a bright sound, what I'm saying. A, a bright light or a loud sound, just sort of, yeah, it's just. So this actually, over time, the religion, the existing re religion surrounding ISIS sort of developed into one of these mystery cults and spread through, and spread through the Greek and Roman empires as sort of this, yeah, just sort of took over surrounding. Yes. So, yeah, over this time, she 
the concept of ISIS actually fused with even more gods, sort of taking on the roles of existing Roman and Greek gods. Like, for example, on that past slide, there was a, she actually took on a bit of sail, like a bit of the concept of sailing through the original myth and that sort of linked into the Greek and Roman gods of sail through the sea and stuff. So yeah, so the only reason that this actually was, ISIS was, the religion of ISIS was actually allowed to spread this far was due to the concept of summa deism, which is basically the, which is sort of the ide ideology that Rome was under, which basically says that all other gods are base, are different interpretations of our gods and different, yeah, just sort of stories and stuff. But yeah, just... That was sort of why Rome was able to accept a lot of religions and was able to expand relatively easily over the Mediterranean. Well, yeah. Okay. So, obviously, this leads to the Brotherhood of Isis, which is sort of the formal name for uh, the cult of Isis. So, the Brotherhood itself was actually was very highly sec secretive, and it, it took a lot to actually join the Brotherhood. Like, this, we'll get into that a bit later, but they were actually pretty non-exclusive in terms of who was actually allowed to join the cult. So basically anybody could just show up and say they wanted to become a best uh, member of the cult of ISIS and go through initiation. They, they just didn't know what to do. So obviously it's a mystery religion, as I said before, and it was also really widespread. Like there are a ton of temples to ISIS that are still standing today in places like Pompeii and stuff. So why would why is this called as as I said before there is a different past definition for cult but they're actually it was actually relatively niche to, even though it was very widespread especially a lot of, in a lot of the higher echelons of the cult there were a lot of more out there sort of practices and stuff but those have been sort of lost time so I can't exactly cover them but there's also like also, there's sort of the modern existence of ISIS, ISIS worship, and like there's actually a lot of sort of exploitation that goes on there due to financially, as you can see by our related picture. ISIS magic is back. That's okay. all it's back. Finally, $174 for ISIS Oh, that's yeah. a cheap price. Exactly. Bye. Bye. All right. Thank you. Okay, so there was actually a lot of, there was a pretty, this, the cult itself was basically set into a hierarchy system where there were some lower level people that were the main way that you would advance upwards through the cult is through going through specific religious rituals that, that were called initiations. So through in the initiations would usually take the form of stuff like uh, baptisms or fasting, just sort of. It, the idea was to cleanse yourself through ISIS and sort of advance through, to become advanced through the religion that way. Then, as I mentioned, there were a lot of different temples across the Roman and Greek empires, and specifically the Babet el Pigaro. I don't know if I pronounced that correctly, but that was mean. That's where the cult was thought to begin originally, and yeah, that sort of a temple survived for quite a while under. So a lot of their practices involve heavily involved water due to that sailing connection that I mentioned earlier, and also just sort of the concept of the Nile itself being the source of life for each for Egypt and stuff. But what as I said before, a lot of the mysteries of the initiations involved water, like for example, like bat, baptism and stuff. Just so there's also they also wore specific clothing, typically in the form of white linen robes and I saw this stuff in some sources. They apparently sometimes would shave their heads. Just sort of. Huh. There's also this uh, rattle that they use called a sistra for a lot of the rituals. You can see it in the upper pitch right there. It was sort of meant to resemble a symbol that we'll get to later. You may have heard of the onk, sort of. Just, yeah. And then there was this. And then they had this large festival called the Nawikium Isidus, which is sort of the, which is su supposed to be a, like a large tribute to the goddess Isis and just 
basically what they would do is that they would put a figure of Isis on a boat and then look, load the boat up with like with sacrifices of spices and just various other things. So then let it send it down a local river into the ocean and just let it sink. Basically, it was this very like big event usually, and there are a lot of recorded examples of of this happening in cities like Alexandria and so, stuff. We'll get to a bit more of the influences of this festival later. So, as I said, they 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 recruited almost everybody, and but specifically lower classes and but and the the way that they mainly did this is through the the promise of things like a the promise of a positive afterlife, which was actually pretty uncommon in the ancient world. So the you may have heard of the god of Hades and Christianity, Hades slash Pluto and the Christianity was around at this time, but Hades and Pluto were mainly just feared by people as a symbol of death, and then Christianity was actually banned by the state, which just due to how like not like how it sort of clashed with Roman ideology and stuff. But yeah, it also was actually pretty loose worship wise, even though it was pretty like I you know it was pretty pretty clearly dedicated to ISIS, but there were no specific bans on who on like if you could worship another god outside of this. Or, yeah. Just okay, got it. So basically this and all of this came falling down when Christianity was insane as the main religion of the Roman Empire, just to because of how less inclusive it was to other gods and goddesses of, of other cultures and just, yeah. Yeah, this also led to the end of mystery religions and it, while it didn't like, and while the worship vices in them end immediately, it certainly dwindled down until it was eventually banned altogether in Egypt. Which, yeah, just completely gone basically. And then we get to ISIS in modern times. There was actually a, a lot of there's actually a lot of sort of like specifically in the Renaissance, there was a lot of art depicting Isis as this goddess of nature who taught who taught the tools like the skills of civilization to humanity. There were like later the Freemasons get involved in this, and we would see plays like uh, about Mozart's The Magic Flutes, which includes her as a key plot point. We sort of see this cyclical pattern in her like worship and depiction over time. So, like, for example, in the 1930s, there was this movement for independence from Britain and Egypt called Pharaohism, where she was depicted a lot as sort of the spirit of Egypt itself, and just, yeah. Just, yeah. Then, like, a lot of the more modern, a lot of the more stuff nowadays sort of is based around this idea of modern paganism, which a lot of people in that sort of religious group see her as a as one of the primary goddesses of or it's call her the great goddess is sort of well it's sort of this reinvigoration of like the previously mentioned like, Roman idea of all of other gods being the interpretations of this one being. Just yeah pretty, pretty interesting. But yeah then there was a bit of there was actually some clear influence yeah so there's some clear influence on Christianity in the form of Specifically, like a lot of the worship of Mary sort of stem could have stemmed from this idea of like, Isis and, and like, there's actually the festival of Corpus Christi in the Iberian Peninsula, which is Spain, Portugal, that takes a lot of influence from the, the, the previous mentioned festival. And then sort of this sort of is a bit tangentially related, but the cross actually has some roots in a lot of Egyptian religion with the uh, with the Ankh, which is a symbol of life. Win. Okay, I've done it. Yeah, we got it. Yeah, I'll just go over. Okay. So I came upon this website called resurrectisis.org, which is sort of the. It was sort of a lot of, ties in with a lot of the more modern aspects of ISIS, like specifically your worship in more esoteric circles and. Yeah, it sort of just had this a lot of like crazy imagery of just like just out totally out there claims and stuff. But I just thought it was really interesting, so I wanted to include it on there. But yeah. I'm like gonna get the web page we all can join now. Yeah, yeah we can all can join. This is really interesting. I like the impact with everything. It's 
Right, good, good job. Yeah, please. Feeling things. I know I have customers. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You're still not in. Did you email it? I did. I shared it with you. So, okay. Church Universal and Triumphant by me. So, you're going to notice a theme. It'd be great. It's going to be awesome. As long as the mouse, just put, as long as the cursor is off screen. Just, ooh, wow, cool. Uh, transitions and stuff. Okay, so it comes from the uh, I Am movement, which was like a huge movement. A lot of cults came from it. Uh, started out with Mark L. Prophet in 1958 with, uh, it was called the Summit Lighthouse. Um, like the Pearls of Wisdom was a, a huge, basically, Bible thing for them. Um, and then Mark L. Prophet had a wife, and then he met Elizabeth Claire Prophet, and then he was like, no to his wife and then he married elizabeth claire prophet who also had a husband beforehand that seems to be a theme like meeting someone and then getting anyways this was in 1973 and then it became church universal and triumphant um basically they said give us your belongings and you'll uh go to heaven and you'll ascend um okay Core beliefs. So there are 11 core beliefs. I'm not going to list them out because it's way too long. But the two main ones, and I will talk about on the next slide, are the Ascended Masters and Bible Plane. Um, a lot of them were just kind of like baptism, uh, decrees, stuff like that. Um, okay, Violet Flames and Ascended, Ascended Masters. So there's seven rays, and along with that, seven patron saints. Um, there's like there's uh, Buddha, and there's a lot. Um, and each have different characteristics. So depending on the certain characteristics that you have, you um, become attached to a specific patron saint. Um, and then you kind of like worship them sort of. Um, and then the violet flame is like the flame of joy. The flame, the violet flame uh, like lives inside of you. If you're happy, then the violet flame is burning bright. You know the normal stuff. Uh, Saint Germain is probably one of the most popular and like biggest um, patron saints. He's kind of the one who uh, he's one of the ascended masters that came to Elizabeth Claire Prophet and uh, told her what to do and everything. So he's just kind of like a huge ascended master. It makes you better. The violet flame. All right, so base rituals uh, are decrees. This is a huge part. Uh, it claims to help, claims to solve and help with worldly problems. It also will help with the AIDS epidemic that is going on right now. People, come on, um, say your decrees so you don't get AIDS. Um, so they would film these decrees. I watched a couple, and it was. It was actually pretty intense because it was just Elizabeth, like they filmed this and they filmed um, Elizabeth Claire Prophet saying these mantras and decrees and she was chanting and then you could hear the people in the background chanting along with her and it was like really fast and um, so decrees and these mantras and uh, prayer was a huge thing, praying to your patron saints and uh, meditation was also a huge and that is um, Elizabeth Claire Prophet and uh, Marco Prophet. So, some techniques to get new recruits. This is um, a picture from one of the videos I watched of, uh, uh, of Elizabeth Prophet uh, doing like degrees of modules and stuff. Um, and it was mainly just books and videos. I have the book in my backpack. I should have like 
but whatever, it's fine. Um, basically talking about uh, certain things that you can and can't do. Uh, they're all purple because of like the violet flame and all of my slides are purple because of the violet flame. Um, and videos were also a huge thing. They would like uh, broadcast their, their like meetings and everything like that. Uh, and yeah, super interesting. So who they wanted as members, really easy, anyone with property, uh, specifically young people because, you know, they're in the church for longer and they can give you more money. Uh, basically, you would give all of your money and belongings to the church and you would uh, like come together as a congregation and you would support each other. All right, so some main characteristics is it's a Milleranian group. I can never pronounce that. Milleranian group. That's their dog. Um, and so, like, you know, end times, apocalypse, everything. Um, they believed that the end times would come because of, like, built-up karma. They also believed in karma. That's a huge thing. Um, they believed that it was because all of this bad karma would be built up and then it would just suddenly happen because uh, it like just everything would just explode and yeah. Um, so the AIDS epidemic was also a huge part of it um, in the 80s because the suspended was pretty big. And so uh, Elizabeth Clare Prophet used that as the, the, the end times are coming. Uh, because we have all of these people dying of AIDS. They also said no rock music, which made me sad because I like rock music, but they didn't say anything about like heavy metal or anything like that. So if you listen to heavy metal, you're good. Um, another picture. So, Colton, Montana? What? Something interesting about Montana? Wow, wow, wow. Okay. Aaron Prophet, uh, uh, Elizabeth Clare and Marvel Prophet's daughter. She then uh, like uh, escaped from the cult, and she now writes a blog. And I think she wrote a book or something. I don't remember, but I read her blog. Very interesting. Um, she mentioned uh, something about how the remaining members were like, "Oh, COVID nineteen. This is the end times. This is when it's going to happen." And this is a quote from her saying that I thought was super interesting. Was that's the problem with apocalyptic prophecy, it can always be adapted to fit the next disaster, which I think is super interesting because that's something that's super prevalent here. Okay. Um, outcome. Um, so Elizabeth Prophet was like, on March 15th, 1990, the Soviets are going to come and they're going to bomb everything. So that's why we need to build all of these bomb shelters. So that didn't happen because Soviets didn't come and bomb America. Um, and so then about a third left, which was super, super bad because they were so financially like in the dirt because they had no money. They sold, they quit their jobs. They basically sold everything uh, for uh, like guns and ammunition and for food because they needed to stay in these bomb shelters. And so, uh, it's still there, but it's a lot smaller. And then after uh, 1990, um, there were still a couple like, oh, it, it's still going to come. I was wrong. But then uh, Elizabeth Clare Prophet, uh, she got Alzheimer's. And so then she retired in early 2000s. I think it was like something like 2000, maybe it was the late 1990s. And then she died in 2008. Yeah. And we're in Montana again? Um, it, it's near Yellowstone. So actually, has anyone ever been to Yellowstone Hot Springs? That's actually owned by Church University in Triumphant. Fun fact. So you went to a cult place. Fun fact. <laughs> Nice job. Good job. Good, 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 great presentation today. So, those of you who are we'll get to tomorrow. Sound good? All right. And, Dylan, great, great job with ISIS. I love Egyptian stuff. Oh, one thing I will say, I did, 
if you go down to Garrison, the buildings are still there, and they did try to sell a bunch of stuff on eBay. And I personally witnessed flirty fishing, so moving on. Wait, hold on. You want me to tell the story? So I was out when I was in college at Rocky, 18 years old, we're walking out of the food service at lunch, and a bus pulled up. And they just drove in on campus, and a bus pulled up, and it was Family International. I didn't know I'd never heard of them. And all these very attractive young women came out. And it was really weird. And we're all walking, that's huge. And so we we actually walked away. But um, they immediately just kind of globbed on and just kind of attacked young men outside of Rocky. And we lost half our snow out. <laughs> but, and then I remember they called the Billings police. No, they, uh, they, they the school, the, the school called the police. And that's, you know, the bus and they hung out, I think, parked outside of the campus, just kind of parking it for a long time. No idea. And we all kind of looked at this weird bus and yeah. So, uh, no, I did not almost join the call. Okay, so. Yeah, flirty fish, yeah, that was really kind of gross. Good ones today, I really appreciate it, well done. Okay, so I'm going to be gone for All right. I'm we'll probably finishing up things on Thursday. We got to have the tester pretty soon. Yeah. Let's do man. I'll see. I'll try to stop. I'll do a the family now. Okay. Thank you. Well, I'm not part of the test. Test. Do you want me to do it in here or out there? Yeah, shoot it on up. Out. You can just take it to okay. wherever you want. All right. Um, and you get a scan for it. We did a scan for it. I know. I don't like it. I hate changing it. It's good. Good for you. Oh, really? You're going to see the cell there. Like, tell them, right? I can see like who knows or something. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. I'll check it with you. Yeah. That'll make them too. Yeah, I'm trying to decide if I want to do a test. Okay. So, okay. We have this. No, I'll put it right now. Right now we can we'll keep it in your life. Like, like, cool, like, because it kind of would be massive. Yeah, that's not your deal. It's in your deal. Well, yeah, so if you just test, you can get some thing. All right. I'm not worried about it. Yeah. Oh, see, yeah, I'll talk to you. It's all fun. You have fun. I need to piece of Yep, just give me a Yeah, I, uh, I was, I'm testing them all. I guess they can be friends. 
You got fun with that. I will try so hard.
You have a pen for your own service. Yeah. You have a crayon for all the pictures. Yeah. Okay. Also, I always really enjoy your like funny answer answers. Like seven guys named Andy showed up and she just jumped down the shoulder. They make me big. Oh, it's just me. That, that's not what happened. Oh, well, yeah. Sorry. I guess I got that. For the short answer questions, it says answer one of the following. I'm going to see one of the following three. Okay. okay. Yeah. I yeah. When I originally made it, I only gave two choices. I had a third. Forgot to change. Okay. Yeah. I was just making sure.
No sweat, doing well? Yeah. You done? Yeah. Sure to answer questions, you have three, three sentence short IDs. Yeah, it's all mushed together though. It's Mike. That's what it's That's why the AP exam, they want you to mush them together. Okay, so yeah. I realize that I probably should have done my name. There's three of them here. It's good. All right. Hey, good job doing your presentation. Thank you. I was really nervous. You did well. You did well. Well, I'm glad you approved. I think everyone enjoyed it. Yeah, a Montana call. Yeah. I feel like there's not very many like exciting things about Montana. Make it like super, like, yeah, it's like unibombers and calls. That's true. But they have the other trying to ban the teaching of science, but right now, yeah, all righty then. Just what we 